Welcome back everybody, hit that like, hit that subscribe, comment down below, let's have that nice football dialogue. You can tell me what you think, tell me where you think I'm going with things, tell me what your ideas are, I'd love to hear them, but let's have this conversation in the comment section. Uh, like I said, welcome back. Today we're going to discuss a couple things. Um, we're going to start off with what Mike McDaniel said about Tua Tunga Bailoa. Mike McDaniel just recently had an interview, and the interview basically went along the lines of how did you know that Tua was your guy? And I think Mike McDaniel's answer was just awesome. And I, I just think it just showcases what fans like us think about Tua and what we see in the kid. Because to be honest, everybody that actually knows football, if you watch the kid play, he has the potential to be very, very good. And I mean, when you look at some of his throws, they're, they're throws that, like Mike McDaniel would say in the interview, which basically was is that he was asked this question of how he figured out that Tua was his guy. And essentially what he came up with was he was trying to get skill players. And he was really trying to get skill players for Tua because he thought of his game and he also thought of the uh, offense that he was trying to run. And he took a look at Tua's film. And basically what happened was when he took a look at Tua's film, he, uh, he, he saw what they call outbreaks, which are very hard throws to make. It's essentially when someone cuts to your opposite side. So if you throw it not right, it could easily be a pick six. And Mike McDaniel is watching the tape. And he basically sees that Tua is making outbreak throws that most quarterbacks make he said four in one game or a couple games where two is doing them like seven or eight times a game and Mike McDaniel said that he sat there and he watched these throws and he was just astounded by some of the throws that he was making these outbreak throws that are really high difficulty and it's something that you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself to be able to make these throws. Essentially what happened was he watched, I think he said 700 throws that Tua made. And he started looking at all the, the ways that he was throwing the ball and you know everything that he was doing. And he just, he got up, immediately called Chris Greer, immediately called all the training staff and basically showed them like, hey guys, and said right to their faces that, we have a gold mine here. If we can just maximize the potential of Tua, we have we have a a bottle rocket in the pocket. I mean, he essentially says that Tua is a gold mine and that he is a point guard. He basically plays point guard. Um and essentially he is the best point guard that he has ever seen in the system that he runs. And he said essentially that Tua is the perfect quarterback for his system. A lot of you guys want us to get Lamar Jackson or who, you know, at this point, there's so many freaking names. I mean, some of you now are going to Trey Lance. I think at this point, it's just become more of a, let's just throw names out there because it gets you popularity or I don't know. Tua has come into the league and it's just basically been that most of the people line their uh, analysis and their football knowledge based upon getting views and likes and all this other stuff. Whereas essentially what they do is they use Tua as the name to pump their channel up because, you know, if you write these bad things, a lot of people are going to come and comment and all this stuff. And, you know, you're going to have a show for, for yourself. And, you know, like I said, another one now is Trey Lance. It's like, Every quarterback in the NFL, apparently the Dolphins are, are trying to trade for, which it's not happening. I, I just, I don't understand, you know, I, I get everybody wants different things, but it's not happening. Tua is going to be our quarterback. And 
What we're really waiting on only at this point is that if Tua stays healthy, because if he stays healthy, Tua is the perfect quarterback. He showed it last year. Sure, he had a couple bad games. Okay, so does every quarterback. But for the most part, when we see the potential that Tua has, I think us fans are, are just basically with the same Mike McDaniel mindset where you see some of these throws and you're like, bro, <laughs> that's nuts. Like, I think it's like when people look at certain things and they want to see crazy explosions in movies but sometimes the best movies are the ones that just make you feel emotional and i know it's a weird reference but i think that's what it is with two is like everybody wants to see these crazy highlight plays but what they don't see is that some of the 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 just throwing the ball to a receiver is almost the same as some of these crazy plays yeah he's not running around for 50 yards every single play that he's on the field but he is fitting the ball in between three defenders almost every time he throws the ball, which is incredible. I, I, I understand like there are some quarterbacks in this league that you see it. I'm telling you right now, I, I look at a lot of the tape. A lot of these quarterbacks, they don't fit the ball in like Tua does. Tua's anticipation is so good that sometimes, and by what I mean by sometimes is like 50% of the time, he is fitting the ball in between three defenders to get to a guy. Mike McDaniel, I mean, he explained it the best thing. And, and this is essentially what we all see as two of fans is that you have a gold mine right here. You have the guy that is like one of the most accurate that I've ever seen. And on top of that, he is mobile. So it's not like in the pocket, he is not elusive. When you watch him in the pocket, the kid moves around and gets away from so many would-be sacks. So uh, what we're what we're going to go based on right here is that we're going to get running backs in the draft, I believe. We're going to get another playmaker. And you have the second year in the system, which they also would say with Austin Jackson. And I think a lot of people there, they're like, you know, writing Austin Jackson off, which I understand that. But again, you have to kind of know football a little bit and see that, you know, not every player becomes the best in their first couple of years. So Mike McDaniel also explained that in the interview is that, you know, there's a guy that he had in the 49ers that the first couple of years they considered him a bust. And then they got him to where he needed to be and he became a pro bowler. So that is what he's trying to do with Austin Jackson and Liam is that he's trying to put them in a system that isn't changing because when Brian Flores was there, you had a system that was ever changing. You always had different offense coordinators. You always had a different offense. You always had things that were just moving around. So many pieces that a rookie can't really get used to where, like what his skill sets are and where he can maximize those because you're constantly trying to learn new offenses. You're constantly trying to figure out what you need to do instead of just fitting in, buckling down and learning and progressing i think what we see is like a lot of people need to understand that having different coaching staffs in the league your athleticism sure if you're very athletic and you have those traits you can succeed but for the most part it's very hard for an nfl player to be successful in his first years if his coaches keep changing because you have different systems you have to learn all these new things and you can't really get acclimated to your surroundings because you're constantly trying to learn new stuff. So what Mike McDaniel is trying to do with our offensive line, which again, I still believe he might. A veteran right after the draft, depending on who slips and who falls, because again, with the draft, you, you never really know who is going to fall, who's going to slip, who's going to stay there, who's going to be there. You don't know these things, so you never know. So what they're trying to do is you have the free agency that we already did, and then you're going to have the <clears throat> you're going to have the veteran free agency, which basically all the veterans that are still out there, then you sign your your last remaining pieces after the draft. So that's essentially what you're doing with Austin Jackson. I think you need to realize that the skill set, and I understand, you know, we can't get everything that we want right off the bat. It's tough to do that. You can't just have the player you want right off the bat, but you have to look at the past circumstances for some of these players and see that, okay, you know, even with Austin Jackson, maybe he doesn't turn into the superstar that you want 
You know, maybe he doesn't turn into the guy that, you know, we thought we were drafting. That's uh, okay. That, that might happen. But what you can do is you can still have a young player that is solid. You know, not outstanding, but is solid that you can just have him there and he can fill that positional need because you can't have studs all over your team. It's very hard to do that. You know, some people have to have openings and, you know, it's understandable that it's the offensive line. I think we're going to address that as well. But, you know, we have really good players on the offensive line. Connor Williams, uh, Robert Hunt and Teron Armstead. They are great. Toronto Armstead gets a little injured sometimes. But if you just add one more player that is good, which if Austin Jackson can be that player, then you have a solid offensive line. Yes, left guard or whatever remaining role still needs to be filled. But you can, again, get a young guy in the draft. But putting these guys in a second year of the system, just like Tua, is going to maximize their potential. Because, you know, unfortunately, Austin Jackson got injured. But like I said, if you watched him in the preseason and in the first game, um, when our offensive line was like the way it was supposed to be for this last season, it looked really good. And, you know, unfortunately, there was a lot of injuries. And like I even said in my previous video is Liam looked better when Tehran was in, you know, because he could call things out and he could understand defenses a little more. So we have to look for that. They're going to get some competition, but they're not trying to get a really big time offensive lineman. They're trying to develop their young players. That is the, the philosophy that we have now is draft young players, fill the needs, and then sprinkle in some big time free agents. But build through the draft, build through your coaching. And that's what we're trying to do these days, which leads me into my another segment, which is, this is the, the, the main thing. A lot of people are trying to sign, you know, the Irv Smith thing. It, <laughs> it's really funny because, you know, uh, Saubert, our tight end that we got from Denver, two years ago, he had basically the same stats as Irv Smith. So again, it's another Tua thing that it's like, oh, it's a slate against Tua. Who cares, bro? It's a tight end that just, he's not even that good. He's from Alabama. You, you have a name that he played with Tua, and then you make a story of it. He has the same stats two years ago. He couldn't even play the year before, and this year he was injured again. Who cares? It's not even that big of a deal. But why we're not signing any players and why we're not trying to acquire anybody or do anything is essentially that these last week or so, um, kind of after free agency, we started working on the Christian Wilkins extension where they are having constant talks with Christian Wilkins. They're trying to get this extension, which if you look back, Chris Greer's drafting, I mean, to be honest, obviously Larry Me Tunsil was like the pillar of trading and getting everything that you needed to get to uh, and this and that but uh the first draft pick christian wilkins was the start of all this and i think they understand that they understand that christian wilkins is the key to this defense he's the heart and soul you have all these great players but christian wilkins is the one that is the anchor for this defense so what they are trying to do they are trying to have your cap space to where you can extend christian wilkins so we have him for a very long time this is what gets me to the ideology of why I'm so excited about the Miami Dolphins is that they're not a team anymore that is going to just bring all these outside players, which they, they do sometimes, but they're not going to fill this team with all these different outside players and not develop their own talent anymore. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get all the players that they want towards the NFL draft. That's what they did. And now they're trying to use their draft picks to get the fillers for the rest of the roster, but they are trying to build a roster that is not just going to be compatible with the NFL for two years. You know, they are trying to get their young players to the point of where they can compete for a very long time. That you have all these players that are young, you lock them up for these contracts, and then you have all these really good players. You know, what it showcases with Mike McDaniel, we'll see what he does next year, but I think it just showcases that Chris Greer right now. He has believed that he found the coach that he needed. He tried with Brian Flores. And what it shows is that he found the coach that he wanted. You know, the coach that is going to discuss things with him. The coach that's not going to fight him on things. And the coach that he can work with to build a team. You know, I think a lot of the old coaching staffs, including Brian Flores, it was just a lot of just just do what I want and it's going to work. And it didn't, it didn't work at all. You know, yes, we won a little bit, but 
the locker room sucked, players weren't developing, and you know, you didn't maximize any of the potential. Sure, you had a good defense, and he was a great defense coordinator. I'll give him that. You know, the defense was always great, but in order to be a head coach, you have to fill a team. You have to make a complete team, not just one half of the ball. Because to be honest, with the Dolphins, it's always been that. It's always been you either have a defense and no offense, or an offense and no defense, or neither. Some of the times we just stunk. And what we're trying to do now, we're, we're signing Christian Wilkins because we realize that, you know, players like Jalen Phillips, players like Christian Wilkins, Jalen Waddle, you know, Tua, these players are the pillars to keeping this defense stout for years to come. And on top of that, what's unfortunate is that the owner screwed us out of a first round pick because this is what people are forgetting too with Chris Greer is that we had another first round pick this year. You know, essentially, we were supposed to have a first, a second, a third, and then a, a sixth and a seventh. We were supposed to have five draft picks. We got screwed out of one of them because we were trying to get Tom Brady. But, you know, it is what it is. We're trying to get players in the draft that fill the needs. Like, for instance, we have Xavier Howard and Jalen Ramsey. But I'm pretty sure next year, not this year, we're going to get a corner to fill that need out where now you have Cater and then you'll have a rookie corner and then these guys can learn under Jalen Ramsey, which is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have a hierarchy. You're supposed to get young players that can learn over these guys. The bad teams, what they do is they try and draft players and just hope that they fill exactly what they need to get done. And what happens is it doesn't always work out like that. What's some of the better teams is they get young players like the Chiefs, you know, um, even like like the Eagles and some of the better teams that go to the playoffs, the Bengals, is they draft these players and they can either be studs or they can learn behind who they have already because they're not asking these rookies to become superstars right off the bat. A lot of bad teams, what they do is they just try and draft these guys in order to make them superstars. And you need to realize that that's what the Dolphins were trying to do too. You're trying to get these guys to build superstars and, and we kind of changed the game a little bit, you know? We, we got all these draft picks. We got all the players that we needed. To be honest, yes, Liam and Austin and Noah, they all stunk. But for the most part, um, Jalen Phillips, Tua so far has looked really good last year. So that's not one. Well, he's, he's showcased that he is the guy. Um, you have Christian Wilkins. You have... Um, Xavier Howard. You have, you know, all these players that are drafted by the Dolphins and built by the Dolphins. They're not doing what they used to do anymore. And that's what's exciting, you know, and that's what we're doing right now. So if you're asking where the cap space and, and why we're not trying to get anybody, yes, we have a, a thing to fill out on the uh, June 1st when we get rid of Byron Jones, but they're using that cap space in order to acquire again christian wilkins for a long-term deal and make sure that we have our defensive tackle he's so important he is the heart and soul he showcase i mean the pressures that he gets on the quarterback he takes up two offensive line you don't realize like how big of a deal that is if a defensive tackle can and needs to take up two offensive linemen because then what is so great is when you have this type of defense you have already put them at a disadvantage because now they only have three offensive linemen left to block everybody. And now when you have Jalen Phillips or Bradley Chubb, now if you put another defender, you're already in a mismatch and you're putting people one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what Christian Wilkins does. Sure, he doesn't get the sack numbers, but he puts everybody in a position to get the sacks. That is why he is so important. And he also gets sacks too and pressures. We are going to extend Christian Wilkins and it's going to be just a great feeling to just get that guy locked down um, and be able to know that he's going to be with us for the next whatever amount of years because he is the heart and soul. He takes up two defenders. He makes it easier for everybody else. He stops the run. I mean, he does everything. He gets sacks. Of course, they're not Aaron Donald sacks, but to be honest, the amount of things that he does, he is second only behind Aaron Donald when it comes to defensive tackles. Um, the pressures that he gets, he does get sacks. He stops the runs. He gets tackles for losses takes up two to three defenders and still gets through these things. Christian Wilkins is just, 
he's he's the guy and we're locking him up and we're gonna have a defensive tackle for a very long time and it's it's just it's amazing to get him because he's such a good guy too i mean christian wilkins is just you can't not love him he's just just a good dude and it's just fun to watch him play um the next thing that we're gonna get into is we have a couple of things and places that the dolphins have visited so there's a couple of uh pro days that we went to so it's kind of going to narrow it down to what we see and what we see fit um i think we're going offensive lineman I, I i have done a lot of research and seen that we look like we're heading towards an offensive lineman but also we went to the alabama pro day we went to the uh tcu pro day and chris greer also went to uh the, the penn state pro day so basically what we did is we met with some players. Um, we went to go watch, obviously, Alabama. You watched uh, Jameer Gibbs. And I think they also were very interested in Cameron Latu, what it looks like. You know, they want to get that tight end. Cameron Latu is going to be that guy that goes in the later round. And, you know, you could probably get him in the, the sixth or something like that. Um, because he's basically just a he's, – he's a blocking tight end. He's a big guy. You know, but you also saw a Brenton Strange um, – from Penn State. Oh, we'll get into that in a second. But um, at the Alabama Pro Day, obviously they're looking at Gibbs, and it looks like they're very interested in Gibbs. What is going to be key is that if he starts falling to us, does he get to us, or do we trade up? You know, to get to him because, again, I mean, I really do think that Jameer Gibbs is probably the he is probably the running back that Mike McDaniel really loves um you you have a guy that can catch the ball you have a guy that's fast you have a guy that's you know big he can't he's not really 100 percent great at blocking but that's something that you can teach him um but they do like jameer gibbs they like cameron latu as well a lot but uh what i'm also hearing is that penn state brenton strange the tight end for Penn State. He's just a big, aggressive guy. He's 6'4", like 250. Um, he can block. He's very good at blocking. He's a willing blocker. He likes to get in front of people and just maul them. So you have a guy that, you know, <laughs> he went to the same college as Gasicki, but completely different player. You know, I mean, he needs to work a little bit more on becoming a pass-catching tight end, which can be done over time. I think, you know, I think a lot of the time, more so the blocking aspect for tight ends becomes harder if you don't like or are willing to do it or know how to do it. Um, the pass catching, you know, you if you get a good coach, I feel like you can learn the pass catching aspect to be a, a factor. I don't think he's going to be, you know, like a, I don't know, like a, like a, uh, Mark Andrews or something like that but you know to be a willing pass catcher and get to the point where you can be a reliable tight end for three four maybe 500 yards a year a couple you know four or five touchdowns you can be that guy and I think honestly when you look at our offense that is really all they're looking for from tight end I think a lot of people want to be like oh my god we need a crazy tight end to you know do all this stuff I think for the most part they use running backs wide receivers and the tight end is more of like a shorter route type of guy a seam route you know I, I think they more so use the tight ends for blocking and I think that's what we're going to see here too I, we'll see what they do I, I don't I don't know I, I don't I'm not sure what they're going to do in the draft but I think they're more so going to go for running back and offensive linemen um, and then get the tight end in the later rounds because that's why you sign Saubert um, you know, you get Smythe, who has been a decent contributor. You get Saubert, and you have two blocking tight ends that can catch passes. And then you have all your receivers, you know, with the Braxton Berrios, which I think he's going to have an incredible year. And, you know, the Tyree Kills and all that stuff. So I just don't know if they're going to use tight ends like the way that people think we are. Um, of course, it's always good to get a stud at tight end. But, you know, I don't know if they're trying to use their second or third pick. Um, or their their first and second picks on a tight end, unless it's like, I don't know, like King Kate or something like that, which he's not going to get out of the first round. Or like, if Laporte is there or Gibbs, I could see them taking a tight end. But if they don't fall, I don't see them getting a tight end for those those rounds. Maybe in the third they get somebody. Um, but we'll see. Like I said, I mean, 
it's looking like they're going a lot more running back. They're trying to get that young running back that can come in and contribute and be a, a guy for a pretty long time. So, like I said, they went to Alabama. They went to the pro day over there. They're looking at Gibbs and, and Cameron Latu. Then they went to Brenton Strange. Like I said, he 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 was he's a very physical tight end. He knows you know how to block and we can turn him into a pass catcher. And then what I was so so excited to hear i think everybody that knows my channel you know they know that i preach that i love kendra miller out of tcu um and what we saw is that the dolphins they visited and met with kendra miller you know he didn't do anything as pro day because he's still recovering from the uh, mcl sprain but there's a video where it shows him doing squats. So he's he's way ahead of schedule. It's just obviously, of course, you, you know, when you're not fully in shape, you don't want to lower your draft stock by doing a pro day and, you know, not looking the way that you normally look. So it looks like they took a good look at Kendrick Miller or Kendry Miller. And I'm in love with that. You know, I mean, I love that guy as a running back. Like, it's like, you know, it's things that you can't teach it's things like you know pass catching you can teach you can teach someone how to catch the ball you know especially as a running back he doesn't need to be running routes um, you know for 15 yards you know um pass blocking you can teach a running back but the will to just not want to go down when you are getting tackled you can't teach that and that's what you get with Kendra Miller. You know, I, I like a lot of the running backs. Abanacanda had a really good pro day. I think he ran a, in the four threes. You know, so he's a little speedster that they could also look at. But, you know, I'm telling you, I, I think Kendra Miller, he's just got that, you know, you want, in a, you want in your running back, you want that dog. You know, you want that guy that's just going to power the defense over. Just like Moster kind of did towards the end of the year last year where he was just running into defenders and, and pinballing them, basically. Kendry Miller is that type of guy where, you know, I, I think people are underestimating his speed. I, a lot of people are trying to tell me, like, he doesn't, he's not as fast as the other. I'm telling you right now, I watched some of his tape. When he gets into the open field, he's fast. He's very fast. And I think, honestly, he runs four, mid four, four ish, maybe four, five. I think he's plenty fast for a big old running back. He's 220. Um, it, it's just, I'm just, ugh. You know, there's so many running backs in this draft. <laughs> Unless Jameer Gibbs falls, I don't think we take one in two. But I think in round three or round six, Deuce Vaughn and a couple others, you know, I think they're good. But I just, I love Abana Kanda. I love Ty J Spears. Kendra Miller, man, I just, I'm telling you, there's just that it factor that, you know, I think when you get to the NFL, that's what translates the most is that unwillingness to go down and it's just one of those things that when you see a player do that your whole team gets revived no matter what is happening and it's just something that you know you can't teach that that is a person's unwillingness to give up on any play which you know not saying that that's when you get tackled that's you're giving up but just his mentality of like you're going to need three people to bring me down or else I'm not going down. And if you think these leg tackles are going to get me, nope, because I'm going to put my hand in the ground and I'm going to pump myself right back up off the floor. I mean, like I said, it, the unwillingness to go down is just a trait that I just it's it's hard to see it in a lot of these other running backs. You know, I mean, I love Gibbs. I love even, you know, Bijan, but I just Kendra Miller is just one of those guys that he just he just gives you that spark. I don't know. He just if if they pick up Kendra Miller in the third or maybe even trade down and get in the if you trade down and get him in the fourth, it's just I'm gonna be celebrating. I'm gonna be doing backflips because I think that's the that's the gem running back in this draft. That you don't have to draft really high, but he has just a really high high threshold and a high potential that he could be great. Um. Oh, yeah, if we get him and we get like Schmitz or we get Laporta or something along those lines, man, I'm just, you know, I think that would be, you know, a Laporta or a Schmitz or a Cody Mock and then get a Kendra Miller, you know, or one of the other, a Banikander or Tajay Spears. And then you get your tight end in the six or, or you get like another offensive lineman in the six. I'm happy with that. So that's going to be my take on this. 
All right, well, as always, everybody, you know, I hope you like this. Like I said, hit that like, hit the subscribe, comment if you like this video. Tell me if you didn't, whatever you want. Tell me these things. But as always, hope you have a great rest of your day. Fins up. Peace.